Recurrent neural networks have long been used for sequence processing. Underlying their power is the way that they successively process each time step in a sequence, while keeping a memory of previous time steps, which allows the model to analyze the sequence as a whole. However, this same operating scheme also presents issues when we try to train the model using backpropagation. In this video, we'll explore why this is the case. So as an outline, we're first going to talk about how RNNs are trained through a process known as backpropagation through time. Then we're going to investigate some of the challenges with this, which include exploding and vanishing gradients. And finally, we'll touch on some solutions that have been proposed to deal with these problems. But first, a very quick refresher on RNNs. So these models have been used in a great variety of sequence applications, such as time series forecasting and natural language processing. Now, they are well suited for this because their memory of previous time steps gives them a context under which they can process the next time step. And this enables them to do tasks such as next word prediction. Now, this memory basically consists of some hidden state vector h that is transmitted across time steps by a recurrent connection. To see how this is used, let's take a closer look at the forward pass of the RNN. At some time step t, the input xt determines the hidden state h through a weight matrix which we're going to call v. However, h of t is also determined by the hidden state at the previous time step through some weight matrix w. Now finally, our output y of t is determined by our hidden state through a weight matrix u. So basically, y of t is a function of ht and is calculated using some activation function, sigma y. Meanwhile, our hidden state ht is calculated based on ht minus 1 and xt with its own activation, sigma h. Crucially, these parameters u, v, and w remain the same whichever time step we're looking at, and this can present some issues as we'll see later, particularly with w. All right, so now that we have our basic scheme, let's see how we can calculate our loss, which we assume just to be the sum of some loss at each time step. Now this loss is typically calculated based on the ground truth output y hat of t and the predicted output y of t. So now to optimize our model, we'll have to find the gradient of L with respect to our weight parameters u, v, and w. Now to find the gradient with respect to u, it's relatively straightforward because there's just a simple expression through which u influences y. However, it's a little trickier to find the derivative with respect to w, and this is because the dependence on h of t on w is a bit more complex. To see this, let's look at how h t is calculated during the forward pass through time steps. So as we've seen, h of t depends on both x of t and h of t minus 1 and this dependence between time steps is controlled by the recurrent weight w. However, h of t minus 1 itself has some dependence on w because it is affected by h of t minus 2. And we can keep going like this, so essentially to find the loss gradient with respect to w at some time step t, we must backpropagate through time to find the gradients at every prior time step. So we're basically unfolding our model across time steps and treating it just like any other feedforward network except now our recurrent connection weight w is shared between layers. So now the question is, how do we calculate these loss signals? And for that, we're gonna need some calculus. Not too much, just a little. So first, we start off with a partial derivative chain rule, which we use to find the derivative of some function f, which is itself a function of subfunctions p and q. Now to fit this into our context, we can say that h of t is a function of two functions p and q, where p is just equal to w itself, and q is equal to h of t minus 1. So now we can differentiate and just cancel out this term because it's equal to 1. Now this equation looks a little weird because we have dht over dw on the left-hand side and also dht by dw plus something else on the right-hand side. But this right-hand version is actually what we call the immediate partial derivative, which is to say the partial derivative given that h of t minus 1 is held constant and we'll make this distinction by coloring it yellow. But now, we've still got to contend with this term at the end here, so let's see how we can write it out. Now the procedure here is basically the same, and of course now we can expand out the bracket to get this, but now what we need to do is contend with this term, and so on. 
So what we basically do is just iterate back time steps and accumulate terms that look like this, such that uh, we have this summation here over all time steps from zero to t. And of course, we can denote each individual summation contribution by this term right here, subscripted by k. But now let's see how we can actually calculate this derivative here. So we've already seen our h of t depends on h of t minus 1. And here, for simplicity, we just use z of t to denote the operand of the activation function. So we can now express this derivative using the chain rule. And now all we have to do is express these two terms. Now the first is just the derivative of sigma applied element-wise to z and expressed in a diagonal matrix. To see why, remember that we're finding the derivative of one vector with respect to another. So we're basically essentially finding the Jacobian matrix. Now since the activation function is applied element-wise, all of the non-diagonal terms become zero. So we end up with this. All right. Now we have to find this term. And here it's just equal to w. So quite simple. All right, now we've basically got some time-independent expression for our derivative, which we'll just call omega. And we can see that the gradient contribution from time step k is just the repeated multiplication of this term, t minus k times. And this is just due to the product over here. So basically, our contribution is equal to the immediate derivative at time step k multiplied by omega to the power of t minus k. Now, since our matrix multiplication can be seen as a transformation vector space, we can see this as the repeated application of the transformation associated with matrix omega, t minus k times. Now, this realization enables us to foresee two problematic cases. The first is where omega increases the size of the vector. Hence, the vector can grow exponentially as we keep applying this operation. This is known as the exploding gradients problem, and it leads to massive instability during training. The flip side is when omega decreases the size of the gradient vector, which can lead to the vanishing gradients problem. And in this case, the model struggles to learn long range dependencies within a sequence, because the loss signal vanishes when t minus k is large. Now this is clearly a problem for some cases such as language where we might need to learn long-range dependencies of this kind. Now, there are solutions for this, but before we explore them, I think it's worth delving into a more rigorous analysis of the conditions that create vanishing and exploding gradients. So basically, in this paper here, the authors provide a mathematical treatment and relate the exponential increase or decrease of gradient magnitude with the eigenvalues of our weight matrix W and in particular, the largest eigenvalue by absolute value. And the absolute value of this is just called the spectral radius. Now intuitively, this value is important because the eigenvalues of omega are basically the scale factors by which omega stretches the gradient vector along the direction of each associated eigenvector. So if the spectral radius is less than one divided by some value gamma, which we're gonna talk about later, then the gradient vector is going to basically shrink in all directions. And if it's greater than 1 over gamma, then we'll get exponential increase, provided that there is a component of the gradient vector that points in the direction of the relevant eigenvectors. This is why they say that it's only necessary and not sufficient for exponential increase. So intuitively, this checks out. But how do we actually arrive at these results? Well, to figure this out, we're going to need just a tiny smattering of linear algebra. So here we turn our focus to omega and assume that it's diagonalizable. This means that we can express it as a product of three matrices where the third is the inverse of the first. Now, if we express it in this way, then the columns of Q form our eigenvectors and the diagonal values of D are their associated eigenvalues. Now, by definition, when we multiply an eigenvector by the matrix, we just get the eigenvector back, multiplied by the eigenvalue. So there is no change of direction. But of course, generally, when we multiply some vector x by omega, we do get some change of direction. However, since the eigenvector set forms a basis, we can actually express any vector in the space as a linear combination of eigenvectors, which just means that when we multiply x by omega, we can directly scale the eigenvector components of x. And in fact, we can easily think of this in change of basis terms. 
In this picture, multiplication by omega is a three-stage process. First, we multiply x by the inverse of q, and this just transports us to the eigenvector basis. Then we multiply it by our diagonal matrix D, and this is just a direct scaling, since multiplication by a diagonal matrix just scales the vector components. And now, lastly, we multiply by Q to bring us back to our original basis, and we therefore complete our multiplication by omega. Now if we keep repeating this multiplication, say m times, then most of our change of basis operations cancels out. And this makes sense, since all we're doing is flipping back and forth between bases. But our diagonal matrix is brought to the power of m, which means its elements are also brought to the power of m. So what we have is a change of basis followed by some scaling that could be incredibly large or incredibly small, depending on the eigenvalues, and then a change of basis back. Now if our m is equal to t minus k, then it's easy to see how we can end up in a situation of either vanishing or exploding gradients. So now we can actually rephrase our conditions for these problems in terms of the spectral radius of omega. And from here, it's just a short step to framing these rules in terms of our weight matrix W, which is our eventual goal. Now, if we now decide to diagonalize W, we can now express omega in terms of the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of W. Our new diagonal is just the eigenvalue matrix of W, which is now scaled by the first derivative of our activation function sigma. Now we've seen that if the absolute value of this whole thing is less than one, then we're gonna get exponential decrease. Now in some cases, our activation function is going to have an intrinsic maximum absolute value. For example, if it's a sigmoid, then this value, which we call gamma, is gonna be equal to a quarter. Now it's clear that if the spectral radius of W is less than one over gamma, we're gonna get exponential decrease, since now this whole term can never be greater than one. And similarly, we can derive a necessary condition for exponential increase. So this is how we can phrase our conditions in terms of our weight matrix W and our activation function sigma, whose derivative has a maximum absolute value gamma. Now, finally, we can talk about some solutions to deal with these issues. And one simple solution is norm clipping, which basically enables us to tackle the exploding gradients problem by restraining the norm of our gradient vector with respect to some parameters theta to be below some specified threshold. Another solution is to add a regularization term to the overall loss function. Now what this regularizer does is it basically encourages the model to preserve the norm of the gradient as it travels back in time. Now for some time step k, the only way for the summation term to be zero is for this fraction here to be equal to one which means that multiplication by omega does not actually change the size of our gradient vector. Now a third solution is the use of long short-term memory networks, which add a bit more complexity to the operation of the model as a whole. The LSTM deserves a whole video in itself, so I'll just leave you with this for now.